Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Moore is, has given grand rounds this morning. His particular interest is being in carotid disease, but he, more than that, he is a senior leader in the vascular surgery world and has really seen remarkable changes taking place. And you were one of the first people who embraced aortic endographs. Why? I mean, you were an established practitioner. We had a perfectly good operation, and all of a sudden, one of the senior leaders is doing endovascular surgery. Well, it's kind of interesting because uh, when I was in training and in the early part of my career, uh, interventional specialties didn't exist. And so we would do all of our own angiography, uh, including catheter-based angiography. So uh, at a time of my training, I developed uh, some degree of skill with uh, direct carotid intervention, if you will. Um, the story of the endograft is an interesting one because in 1989, I got a call from Harrison Lazarus. Harrison Lazarus is a general vascular surgeon in uh, Salt Lake City and a very inventive guy. He's got a number of patents to his credit. And he called me and he called a number of our colleagues at that time uh, to tell us that he had a new approach to treating aortic aneurysm and wanted to know if we would be uh, members of his uh, uh, committee to evaluate it. I said, sure, happy to do it. And so uh, in 1989, the American College of Surgeons was meeting in Atlanta. And so he and a group of us got together. And after we all signed our, uh, our non-disclosure forms and uh, uh, he then brings out this thing that looks like a fishing pole and says, this is how I'm going to fix aneurysms. And I thought, man, he's really lost it. I mean, how in the world are you going to do that? And that fishing pole basically was the first prototype of a compressed graft with attachment systems at both ends and hooks. And he had already patent, he had patented that device at that time and was carrying out uh, animal models and had just gotten to the point where he had uh, 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 FDA approval. Uh, he had an IDE from FDA. And so shortly thereafter, when all of us became proficient with the use of it in, in an animal model, uh, we then uh, presented it to our ONI or bees. Mm. And it became a race as to who was going to get that put in the first one. And so I was out hustling cases very quickly. And uh, I had one day I had an ideal candidate set up. And I said, you know, here's a new way we're going to fix your aneurysm. And uh, he said, uh, how many of you have done? <laughs> and I said, you're going to be my first. He says, wrong. <laughs> he says, I'm going to be your 10th. <laughs> so, and that went down the line until I finally found uh, someone who was willing to be first in line. And uh, February 10th, 1993, we put in the first EVT graft at that time. And uh, he walked out of the hospital the next day. Now, in between the time, 1989 and 1993, Perotti uh, published in 1992 his first case. And so he had already uh, set uh, the course for this. But again, he was using uh, uh, sort of a homemade device. He had so initially sewed a palma stent to one end, mm -hmm. the proximal end, and then realized that he needed distal attachment as well. And his cases and the early EVT cases were tube grafts. Uh, so you needed to have both a proximal and a distal neck. Uh, the following year, EVT developed a, um, uh, a bifurcated unibody system. And uh, the first of those we put in in 94. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, it took off. And so when you have a choice between invading a major body cavity to do an open repair 
and can get almost equal result with a uh, transfemoral approach, you know, you don't need to uh, uh, think long and hard about that to see the benefit. So that explains why we all, all the EBT investigators went to Salt Lake City to be trained because that's Correct. where Lazarus was based. Right. Very interesting. And so you must still be seeing e patients with the ANCUR system back. They seem to have done remarkably well. The patient that I put the first bifurcated graft in in 1994 is alive and well. I still see some tube grafts. A couple of the patients with the tube grafts I've had to convert mm -hmm. to endobifers because they've developed uh, uh, 1B endoleaks late on. But I still see a number of people with the tube grafts alone who are doing just great. But what I recall was you were beginning to embrace this as a senior leader in the vascular surgery world where your compatriots were exactly the opposite and were very critical of the fact that vascular surgeons were beginning to develop these kind of skills. How did you handle this? Well, you know, my attitude is that uh, times change. And if you don't change with them, you're left behind. And so uh, I think you have to first look at new technology critically and decide for yourself, is this real? Uh, is it as good as what we have? Is it better than what we have? Uh, is it better for different reasons? And if the answer to those questions are yes, then you better get on board or you're gonna be uh, left way behind in terms of what's happening. So move on to, to, to Crest. I'm sure you were brought into Crest as the surgeon and to advocate the surgical world. And yet, what you're interested in today is using carotid stenting, albeit in a somewhat modified fashion. What brought you to that? I mean, why did not stick with carotid end arterectomy? Well, you're right. I, I was very convinced that carotid end arterectomy was going to win that race, um, even without a lot of data to support that conviction. Uh, it just, you know, my concern was that putting a stent in the carotid artery, even with a distal protection device in place, uh, there were going to be periods of time uh, during w which you gain access, during which you uh, are in the process of getting a distal protection device in place, where embolization is a real possibility. And so I was very negative about uh, about the overall approach of transfemoral uh, uh, stenting of the carotid artery. And I think the, uh, the trials, including the trust, CREST trial, pretty much supported that. However, if you looked at the data, once you got by the initial complication rate, the long-term results of stents and endarterectomy were totally parallel. And so the idea was, can we make the, Im the, the initial stenting procedure safer? And if we can, it's certainly less invasive, it's easier, patients recover faster. There are a number of advantages from the patient perspective. And so when the direct carotid approach for stenting with flow reversal came along, that intuitively made good sense to me. And so we got involved in the clinical trial uh, evaluating that procedure and were uh, uh, quite pleased with how easy it was to do and how well the patients did afterward. And so I think that uh, that's very competitive with carotid endarterectomy. Having said that, uh, it gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, respect patient preference. Uh, you know, patients have a right to tell you what they would like to have done. You then can advise them whether that's a good idea, a bad idea, or an okay idea. Uh, I have patients coming along saying, uh, you know, there's this big plaque in my artery that's obstructing blood flow, may cause a stroke. 
I want it out. I want a nice clean artery when it's done. And I say, fine, we'll do a carotid endarterectomy, no problem. I also have patients come along that say, you know, gee, I don't like that big scar on my neck. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do something simpler and less invasive? I say, okay, I now have this approach, the direct carotid approach for stenting, which from the data suggests that it's at least as good, maybe a little better than carotid endorectomy so that we can offer them that. So we have, we have multiple tools there that uh, uh, allow us to um, uh, respect patient preference. So I remember reading a paper, I believe it was John Bergen wrote it, and it was on the 50th anniversary of the first carotid endarterectomy. The title was, A Champion Turns 50. Despite mm -hmm. multiple assaults over yeah. the years, this has become an incredibly durable and effective operation. Is this now the, the, the next death of carotid endarterectomy? Oh, I don't think so. No, 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 not at all. Uh, I think carotid endarterectomy will be just one form of treating carotid artery disease. Uh, either because of patient preference or because of anatomic uh, consideration. Anything else you want to predict about the future of, the, of our specialty? Uh, other than the fact it's unpredictable, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure. It's been illuminating having you here. Appreciate Thank, it. Thank you. <laughs>